Hey, I wanted to thank everyone for coming out today to hear a little bit about uh, the state of Wi-Fi networking, internet working with old retro machines and uh, our attempt to get these old machines beyond the BBS and into the late 20th century. Um, but before I do that, I want to back up a little bit. Now, I want to put you back around uh, 1983, 84, and you're a typical user on a BBS. And what are the sort of things you're looking for, right? Uh, you're getting on there and you're doing a little social media on the message bases. You're, uh, you're chatting with the sysop, so you, you can do instant messaging with one guy. Um, uh, you, could, you can go and download some new programs for your computer, right? And, uh, and if, the, if the BBS you were on around then was you know, run by a rich guy, he might advertise right there on the cover, two bags online. So you were styling then. And, uh, and then you'd have a section there where you could go look at pictures, which were <coughs> typically ASCII, ANSI art, or, or read the news, which is some text file written by somebody three weeks ago. You know, th these, these were the sort of things you would get from your online experience around that time. And then, and then the internet happened. And instead of, of, of being on a forum with, where you could talk to maybe a couple hundred people asynchronously, now you're talking to basically everybody on Earth. Uh, instant messaging, the same thing. Your downloads, it's like every file is available to you. So it's really easy to see why the internet killed BBSs off. And it did it really hard. And, it, and kind of in my experience, it happened really quickly. Um, it, it's one moment, the, a, a telephone line and a modem and somebody you've never met was your networking world. And then all of a sudden they're gone. Um, now, during this period, and I'm talking about like the mid 90s, some, some platforms were able to, because of the technology they used, they were able to handle this transition pretty well. And I really want to emphasize what I mean by that. Um, they, uh, and I'm talking platforms like Windows, Mac, Amiga even, had common APIs for talking to a network. That no matter what technology was behind it, whether it was a, a modem or a network card, your applications could talk to the same API and get the same work done. And this has, this has been huge for progress in all of those, in my opinion, because uh, you can confidently write software for the network and not have to worry that it's only going to run against the one piece of hardware that you happen to have at your house. So your, your potential market for the software you write is very huge. And it also means that you, can, you, can, you know what other people are using, and you can use that as your benchmark. So you're always working against what the last person did. You see progress, progress in the software. And, and I think that was mostly because of these APIs. Uh, now, other platforms didn't handle this so well. And the little case study I'm going to use today as I, as I work my way up to, to modern Wi-Fi networking, the case study I'm going to be using is, are like the Commodore 8 bits. I'm talking like the, the VIC-20, the C64, the C128. Those poor machines did not handle the situation well. In fact, it was very much like an endless parade of brand new technologies, one after another. And each one that would come out would have its own dedicated software that would run on that device, exactly what an API fixes for you. The 64 didn't have that. So every time there was something new that came out, the author of it would make, you know, you'd have two or three programs for that device, but then something better or different would come along and there'd be a new set of two or three programs. So the programs, sometimes they got better, sometimes they got worse. It was like a parade of, of technology. So I'm gonna take you a little bit through that parade because I think that is really super interesting as, as we work our way up to Wi-Fi. In fact, I, I wasn't originally gonna talk about it at all, but I wanted some context for all this stuff. And as I was looking into it, I just realized how almost comical it is. And, and I think you'll enjoy it too. Um, and so let's start with that. The very earliest solutions for these old 8-bits getting on the internet are shell accounts. These were typically provided by ISPs. So the very same providers of your internet would have phone lines for dialing up to the internet, but they would also, a lot of them, provide 
little shell accounts. These were like miniature BBSs in the sense that you would connect to them with a standard terminal program and you'd be given a, usually a, a Linux prompt and you could access the internet from this Linux prompt. So you'd use your standard terminal program, your standard modem, you'd call up your ISP's shell phone number and you could do this with a VIC-20 or a 64 any machine. And so very early on the technology used by the 8-bits was basically the same stuff we were using in the 80s. Nothing really changed. It's just that, oh, we want to get on the internet, so we're going to call our ISP shell account instead of VBSs, because we can get a lot more out of it. Now, during this time, again, this is the mid-90s or so, we started to see the very first hints of fracturing in, in, the, uh, in the technology being used. And that's the introduction of the, uh, it wasn't originally made by CMD, but I'm going to call it the CMD SwiftLink. And it's, a, it's basically a, a UART chip, a 6551 UART chip in a cartridge. You could put in your C64. And you could get speeds up to, I, I believe, uh, 57.6 on, on the original Swift Link. And then the later with the 232, you get like 115 or maybe even higher, 223, um, out, of these, out of these cartridges. And so what that immediately did was it, it caused, uh, caused us to look to very particular terminal programs. So at, at, before this point, uh, any terminal program that you've been using for the last 10 years was good enough. After this point, if you, if you had one of those cartridges, you needed one of the two or three terminal programs that supported it. And this was also, this was also caused by the Unix because we now, now we suddenly needed something that would support VT102 and 80 columns. You, you already started to see a sort of narrowing down of the software available to get on the internet. And so that was, that was where we were at that point in time. Now, uh, getting towards the mid to late 90s now, uh, we see our first new hardware solution. And for this, I have a little story. And that is that um, during this time, around 95, 96, I was working for the computer science department at Texas State in San Marcos. And uh, we had a bunch of Slackware Linux machines. And I was still using Commodore 8 bits, so I had a C128 sitting on the desk in there next to a, some 3D6 running Slackware. And uh, I was chatting with my, uh, at this point in time, I'd only stopped running a board, a BBS, maybe three years earlier. So I still was still friends with all my old BBS buddies. And they suggested, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you make a little null modem cable and run it to your 128. And then if you, if you hook these, these two serial pins together correctly, you can fool a normal Commodore 8-bit BBS program into thinking that, uh, that it's receiving a call when someone logs in to that particular uh, Slackware machine. So made them an old modem cable and made a user on the Slackware machine. And whenever this user logged in, it would run a little program called Minicom, which we stripped down, took out all the options so that it would just run Minicom. Minicom would come up and it would cause what's called the DTR signal on the serial port to uh, go active. That wire was hooked to the DCD signal on the Commodore 8-bit. The BBS program would think, hey, someone's online. Someone's dialed me up on my phone and go online. And so that, uh, that BBS was up around 1996 and only stayed up until I graduated at the end of 96, early 97. But uh, the reason I tell that story is because um, in around 2006 to 2008 is when we saw the first true dedicated solution that uses the same sort of idea. And that was BBS Server by Leif Bloomquist, who's a, a brilliant Canadian guy. And his, I mentioned his name because his name will come up again. He's uh, also very interested in networking on old 8-bits. Uh, BBS Server is a, a Windows app, actually that um, will sit on a serial port and anything that tries to talk to the serial port through a null modem cable, identical to the one that I made for my own board, anything that talks on that serial port will think that the PC is a modem, an old Hayes modem. And it can accept connections from the internet and forward those connections to the device connected to the, the serial port. For example, your Commodore 64 or whatever. And, but it also supports some AT commands so it'll look like a Hayes modem when using a terminal program on the Commodore talking to the PC through that serial port. So in effect, these big expensive IBM clones became giant internet modems. 
And that was a very serious, and it's something I want to also emphasize about all the different technology I'm going to be talking about today. And that is, there are people who still use them. So it, it's like every time one of these would come out, some fraction of the community will latch onto them and say, this is how I'm going to be using the internet with my VIC-20 from now on. And uh, I, I, I happen to know some people still using BBS server. Now, now, the next one on the list there is TCP server by Jim Brain. And that is a Linux port of BBS server. So the same idea. And then the last one is the first time we'll hear from a fellow named All Wise, Always. I don't know if any of y'all know how to pronounce that, A-L-W-Y-Z. -A but uh, he came out with a project, and it's just a project, he sold nothing, called StrikeLink USB, which does the same thing only through USB port. So this is uh, late 90s at this point. Now, early 2000s, and we're starting to actually get 8 bits using dial-up. And this is the, if, if you were on the internet in the early 2000s, late 90s, and it was not AOL, you were using an ISP using either SLIP or PPOE. And believe it or not, these little 8 bits were doing that. And that's, that was mostly solved by software. Um, principally, uh, Linux LNG by Daniel Dahlman. And um, the Wave, which is a browser slash terminal program. And uh, Wings, which is an entire operating system package for the super CPU. But these, these sorts of things combined with, uh, with a modem can get you on the internet. Now, one of the weirder things that we did was um, if you didn't have access to an ISP, but you did have an actual RJ45 cable sitting around, is that you would get on the internet using a Palm Pilot cradle. These were little docking stations, little network docking stations for the Palm Pilot little handheld computing device. And it just so happens that, that, this, uh, that those little pins you see sticking there and there, uh, a lot of those are nothing but RS-232 TTL. So, oh no, not TTL, uh, standard RS-232, it's standard RS-232 voltages. So you would make a, a, a cable very similar to the one that you would make for the, the null modem between a PC, only now you're, hook, now you're wiring up to one of those Ethernet cradles, and that cradle actually runs a PPOE server inside it, and it has an RJ45 plug in the back. So those would be our little internet devices. And I know that sounds crazy, but that, that was actually a fairly popular solution in the 8-bit community for a while. Now we get to what you would think would be the first thing that someone would come up with, and the last, and that is an actual ethernet chip on an 8-bit computer's bus that the computer would do true internet, run, a, run its own TCP IP stack, have all of its own buffers, do all of the work. You, you, would, you would think, and this was uh, first done uh, as, a, as a little, little plug-in board that you would put in a cartridge called Retro Replay. And so it came to be called RRNet. And this was done by individual computers, Yen Schoenfeld, I think is how you say his name, and um, for the Retro Replay Freeze Card. And it contained a Cirrus Logic CS8900A, which has an 8-bit mode that you can run it in. However, in 8-bit mode, it doesn't generate interrupts, so the poor Commodore 8-bit is sitting there pulling it all the time. Do you have a packet? Do you have a packet? Do you have a packet? And, um, and then once it has one, it has 16 registers, and the 64 actually has to do quite a bit of work to yank each of those bytes out of there. But at least it can do it at bus speeds, so that was nice. Um, now, support for this actually kind of gradually came out, because this community has, has stayed kind of cohesive. But there's, there's always something new coming out for it. I think at this point, there's like six or, between six and a dozen programs for the RNet, including um, Kentiki by Adam Dunkels, who some of you may have heard of, because he did, he did this, oh, Kentiki is an operating system, but he did it uh, cross-platform for several different systems, and the 64 is just one of them. And my impression is that it's, it's very focused on the little TCP IP stack that he built. It's, all, it's almost like the OS is just a host for this stack that he wrote. And, uh, and he has a, a little web server and uh, a little web browser, text browser, and FTP client, I think. Little, you know, little programs that run inside it. Um, 
but there's also some just dedicated RRNet programs like Singular Browser, Guru Term. NetRacer is actually a game, uh, I think a car racing game that you can play over the network on one of these, Kipper Term. And uh, eventually this cart hung around so long that people started to clone it. And so nowadays, if you wanted to get one, you wouldn't go looking for the RRNet. You'd be looking for the Mark III, which Jens is still selling at individual computers, or the 64 NIC from Jim Brain, or the final Ethernet, TFE, and I have no idea who makes that one. But uh, these are all clones of the same thing. So, and that's also helped kind of keep this corner alive, but it didn't become ubiquitous. Yes, this, there are fans, but this did not become ubiquitous. Uh, oh, also just mentioning another example of putting Ethernet directly on a computer's, on a 8-bit computer's bus, and that is the 1541 Ultimate 2, which is a cartridge for the C64 that has its own, it, it, unrelated to RRNet, its own networking. I have no idea how it works. There's one program for it. It is just another platform. So we would add that to our, our parade. Now, finally, we're getting to the mid to late 2000s and the microcontrollers have arrived and they have changed the world and we're getting closer to the present here. The first microcontroller internet solution for the 8 bits that I know of was called the Commodore Comet. And the Comet was, is really, uh, he calls it an internet modem and he's right. It, it hooks to the user port on the C64 and it, it does use the standard RS-232 TTL pins on the computer. So he's right to sort of call them, but really to me it's more of a, 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 a connection device for a service. Um, the, the Comet comes with a, which, yeah, you can, you can see it up there. It's an RJ45 jack, so it's a wired internet solution. Uh, he runs a service called CommodoreServer.com. And um, its primary purpose, the big selling point, is that you can load disks and files from his server on the internet to your machine using standard Commodore commands. And you do this by loading this, uh, this wedge software called V1541. You'd load that on your C64. And then if you have the comment in there, you would log in. You would, you would do a load command that does a login, and then you would, you would go out and fetch your files. He, but his service also provided uh, a chat. So there's like chat rooms. It's just one of the things he had on there. So it kind of reminds me of Q-Link a little bit. And then he had some online games. Like you can go play Zork over on CommodoreServer.com, stuff like that. But this is really the, the first time we see microcontrollers as modems. And finally, we are reaching the present. Now, um, in 2015, uh, again, here's Leif, Leif Blumquist, the same guy who did BBS server earlier. He came up with a Wi-Fi modem using a microcontroller and a little screen there. And I think they're actually the same thing. It's an, Ar it's an Arduino of some sort. Um, ESP32. Is it? Yeah, I think it's an Arduino. It's an Arduino. Um, but he, he came up with a wireless networking device that, again, uses the standard serial ports. He would use a standard terminal program on, on the computer to access it. And he called it the Commodore Wi-Fi modem. Um, it had two firmwares that it could run. Uh, mine came with, like, this menu-driven system. And I only recently realized in doing research for this talk that he provided a second firmware that would make it look more like a Hayes modem, which to me should have been his stock, the way he delivered it stock, but instead he delivered it as, a, as this menu-driven thing where you would connect to the modem, you'd press enter and you'd see, choose option one, two, or three. Do you want to connect to your wireless router? Do you want to uh, set up a BBS and wait for incoming connections? Or do you want to connect to a BBS outgoing? And that sort of thing. And it's around this time, uh, or shortly thereafter, that I, I started my little, my little Commodore group in Austin. And uh, I met a fellow who was also interested in making a wireless modem for the 8-bits. And uh, I was really excited to take the technology that Leaf had done and expanded in, in kind of different directions than he did. Uh, the, the little firmware with the menus, that's a really great appliance, right? It, anybody can sit in front of that thing and use it. But for a programmer, it's a dead end. You can't 
you can't build anything on top of that unless you go and recode the firmware yourself. And that's not really what I was thinking, like an end user writing basic should be able to code something for this modem. And so it was with that uh, that uh, we combined our efforts. And uh, oh, the fellow who made that first CC4Net Wi-Fi, his name is Carlos Santiago, and uh, he has a website at electronicsisfun.com, which I'll show you a little bit later. But um, not long after the C64Net came out, um, the same always, always, A-L-W-Y-Z, I have no idea how to say that guy. He came out with another project. So he basically put a post on a web page that said, hey, I've got an idea for a Wi-Fi modem. He called it StrikeLink, and he published his firmware, and he published the schematic for it. And um, so that, that came out probably like three months later. And so we started to see the very first wireless internet devices coming out. And what was unique about both of these, uh, the 64-net Wi-Fi and the StrikeLink, is that they, they weren't meant to be simple appliances. They were meant to be modem emulators, which was a, kind of going back to the TCP server and BBS server idea, the original idea of, of, uh, of computers behaving like modems. Um, also, there, there have been many, many clones of the strike link. If you have like um, the, I don't know, like the Y modem, or there, there's, there's so many, there are lots of strike link clones. And there's a couple of 64 net Wi-Fi clones too, uh, which pop up from time to time. But uh, the strike link clones are far, by far more common. Um, WIC 64 is another, yet another platform. So keep in mind, all of these are adding new platforms and new segments to the, the networking in 8-bit community. Uh, the WIC64 is a parallel device that, um, that you, would, you would send little binary commands to the user port. So it, it, it did not look to the computer like a modem. It was a, a true parallel device, but it had high speed on its side. And uh, he does, he has, as, as in all these cases, there are five or six programs that he wrote for it. So if you're looking for networking for your 64, add that to the list. And the last on here is uh, Link, to, Link 232 Wi-Fi, which is a combination of two of the technologies we've talked about. Um, one of them is the Swift Link, which was the, the new way to get serial on the 8-bits that I talked about in the very beginning. And it, it combines that with a, an ESP32 or, yeah, I think it's a 32, as uh, acting like a modem. So it's like, it's like having a Swift Link in your computer and then a wire running to a, a wireless modem. And as far as I know, software for that is, I, I mean, I've personally written a few programs for it just because I thought it was cool. And um, if you have something called 64 OS by Greg Nasu, which just came out like a few months ago, he, says he's, he said that that's, this is his favorite solution. So that's likely to be a platform for it. The very last thing I want to talk about in here, though, are, are sort of disk drive modem hybrids. And these are hot off the press. This is last, last three, four years, um, mostly, for the most part. The flyer, I think, this is the first one I'm going to talk about, is um, a device that came out, I think, I want to say 2015 to 2016. And it is the next generation of the com of the Comet modem. So the, the guy who did Comet, I have no idea what his name is, but the guy who did both the original Comet modem, which was that online service modem I mentioned, and the guy who did Comet, it's the same guy, and he's always kind of ahead of the game, as you can tell. Um, uh, in this case, though, instead of being a modem that hooks into the standard modem port on the 8-bits, it, it hooks into the uh, disk drive port, the IEC port on the computer. And he launched a brand new service to go with it, just like he had CommodoreServer.com for the modem device. For the flyer, he has CommodoreOnline.com. It's the same deal, though. You, just, you, you download this from his site. Um, you can do chat. You can play Zork. All the same stuff. Although, I, I think when I was poking around in there, I actually saw something that suggests that you might be able to run your own server, which is a revelation. So that would be a new thing. You're not stuck to his service like you were with the original comment. Um, now, these last two, these fellows are here in that room down there, and you can go talk to them. Uh, Jamie and uh, Thomas Cherry Holmes are collaborating 
on a device that's very similar to the Comet Flyer without the baggage of the dedicated service. And they're called FujiNet and Meatloaf, respectively. And they, they've tried to explain the differences. I'm, I was too stupid to follow it. I, I, I did not, and I, I, I apologize, but I, I don't understand the difference because they're working so closely together. And I, I think that's why I don't entirely understand. I, I think that Meatloaf has, and, and FujiNet have different goals, so they may diverge in the future. But right now, the hardware is basically identical, and the firmware is very close. Can you correct me, sir? Uh, yeah, I said it on their, on their talk. So FujiNet um, is very modular, and there's very little 64 support. But if you go to their website, you'll see that they've talked to Jamie, and Jamie is going to be uh, uh, kind of forking Meatloaf into a module that plugs into FujiNet. So, FujiNet project is going to use Jamie's you know, technology to integrate 64s and, and Comparable 28s into FujiNet. So it's, it's going to look like FujiNet because it will be FujiNet, okay. but they're going to use Meatloaf's technology to do the 64 port. And that's on their website. I was looking at that last night, as a matter of fact. And not just 64, uh, Tom was saying that he is attempting to get FujiNet for all the Comparable Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. no he, had a, he had a plus four running, yeah, that yeah. thing. So um, uh, the... the the, the takeaway from this is it is another platform. This time, uh, if you want to write software that gets on the internet, you're going to be talking to your disk drive, or the disk drive port at least, and to a device on it. And uh, you can do networking with it. I mean, he, he's showing off all kinds of uh, different kinds of packets that he's getting from the net using that thing. So it's not just limited to the disk drive, which the flyer is very focused on. Um, now, these last ones I'm just going to mention because they're kind of network adjacent, but these are not network devices. You're not going to be doing online chatting with these. Uh, one is the new PetDisk Max, which is an IEEE 488 device that uh, you can access disk images on a network from a pet. And the last one on there is OneBus, which I'm personally going to buy five of those things. They'll sound awesome. They're uh, they're a device that you can hook any of the 8 bits, including the PETs or the 64 together, and access each other's disk drives over wirelessly. So that thing just sounded awesome. And even though it's not really relevant, I had to mention it. That's just too cool. OK. Um, this slide's just a segue. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know, kind of where I fit into this as I, as I move on to talking about my own stuff. And that is, uh, it's around 84 that I got a Vic modem, and I, I love the darn thing. Uh, by the next year, I was using like the 1650, but either way, it's 300 baud. Um, and, and around that time is when I started running my own BBS and writing BBS software. So I just, to me, a computer's always been a social device of some sort or another. Um, uh, I did the 128 version in 1990, and you can download all these things off the net, by the way. I'll, I'll, I think I have that link somewhere in here. Um, in 96, I told you about the Telnet BBS, and that was just a few years after the, the dial-up BBS shut down. And then in, in 2016, I mentioned that I, I, I got into wireless networking. And that brings us to what I bet you all thought I was going to talk about, and which I am now going to talk about, and that is the firmware for the C64 Net Wi-Fi. I uh, call the firmware uh, Z-Modem. I've heard it referred to as I-Modem or Z-Modem. I'd say it however you like. I honestly don't know how to say it. But these are, this is the um, progression of the original little user port Wi-Fi modems that were designed originally for the C64, but eventually with C128 compatibility built in. And I guess I should mention that now, because some people may not be aware of this, that the, uh, the, one of the important protocols that uh, any modern modem needs to support is called UP9600. And it is, a, it is a trick for getting the best speed out of serial communication by using the bit shifting feature on the chip that's in there. But normally, those pins are not used in a modem. So it's like, it's like those, that was not part of any standard modem configuration. And so it didn't, it didn't make its way from real modems onto any of the newer devices. But somewhere in, uh, you know what, I should, really should wait to get there. But uh, eventually a guy named Daniel Dahlman figured out how to do this by, and not by adding 
new chips or adding a new platform. That's the most beautiful thing. Up96 requires a new platform. Um, he wires some wires together, and so long as uh, your, your software understands how to do the Up9600 protocol, you're good to go. And, uh, and so one of the, one of the, just one of the iterations of this is the addition of a jumper right up there for enabling and disabling the Up9600 pins. And that's because if you try to use Up9600 on C128, you will have a bad time. The burst mode pin on a C128, which is responsible for high-speed access, is also connected to one of the Up9600 pins on the user port. And so if you try to use Up9600, or even a modem that supports it on a C128, the poor darn thing won't boot because it's trying to do a burst mode disk access and it fails. Um, so just some information about the C64 net Wi-Fi. This is the first hardware that, uh, that the firmware was written for. It was based on the um, ESP8266, in particular the ESP01 which was hot off the presses in 2016, if I remember right. Um, it has very little program space, one megabyte, which means if you want over-the-air updates, everything has to be below 500K, because it needs double the space to do a, an, an, an update of itself over the network. Uh, it had 80K of RAM, of which you have maybe 40K left. So yeah, it's, it's, it's painful, but... Um, the C64 net had the neat feature of um, being compliant with those terrible power supplies that we're all told not to use on the C64. It is completely compliant with it. It uses not only the 5 volts on there, but the 9 volt AC converted to 5 volts to get the necessary wattage to run one of these things at, at its peak power usage. So that is a really neat feature of it. It is a user port modem, just like a lot of the ones we've been talking about, because that is the standard for a modem on these 8 bits. Um, and uh, at this point, I also w wanted to talk about something that's kind of fun. It, it, it supports uh, up 9600. It supports uh, baud rates up to, uh, up to as fast as the ESP can go. Um, I typically only test it up to about 57600. But the fun thing about the user port is, is sometimes you'll see people ask how fast can, say, a Commodore 64 go on its user port using standard serial. And it is amusing how that answer has changed, not based on anything changing about the computer, but just based on the brains of really smart people thinking about what they could do with that computer. Now, when, when the machine was released, Commodore themselves advertised that you can do 300 baud reliably, and they were right. However, it was quickly discovered that the wrong timing values were put into the kernel for timing bits, and that only 300 baud had the, the numbers were so far off that only 300 baud would work. If you try to go to 1200, you're all the, the numbers that were supplied, even though it, on paper it supported baud rates up to like 9600 baud, the timing values just weren't there to support it. But that, that was fixed just by changing one little value in RAM uh, in, a, in a place where these, these timing values are copied to. So that was super easy to fix. So pretty quickly, by even the early 80s, we were doing 1200 baud, if you could get a modem that fast. But it was proven that the user port could do it. Now, uh, forward to the 90s, and a fellow named Ilker, and I am not even going to try, uh, but he is an awesome guy, he is a brilliant guy, figured out that if you just wrote the bit banging code that fakes serial, if you just write that code well enough, you can do far better than 1200 or 2400 baud. And, um, and it's, it's actually his code that I borrowed for a lot of my apps because he's right. When, when the C64 is not having to do a bunch of garbage related to disk drives and other things on its NMI interrupt and, and focuses all of its energy just on serial, you can get pretty crazy speeds. Then I mentioned Daniel Dahlman in Up9600, which is, is a kind of a hardware solution because you have to connect certain pins together. But it's pretty lightweight. You don't have to make the changes to your computer. It can be something, just a feature of the modem. And then the last one, a uh, guy named uh, George or, yeah, I think George or Jorge, I'm, I'm not sure, Castillo, um, proved that you can do 57600 bit banging with a one megahertz processor on the user port on a C64. And you will never believe how he did it. All of these solutions above there all have one thing in common. And that is, they use a little timer that's built into one of the chips on the C64 
to time the bits as they go out on the serial port. You, you tell this little timer, okay, I want you to wake me up in so many nanoseconds or whatever, and then I'll send my next bit. Now wake me up for the next one, and so forth and so on. The way he did it is by saying, screw that, that's too, way too slow. There's not enough, not enough fineness in the, in the time signature. Plus, you have to worry about something, uh, something called bad lines, which I won't go into. But anyway, you, you, can't, you can't get high speeds out of that. What you need to do is count the number of cycles that each instruction that you execute between bits takes. And if you do that carefully and put your knobs in the right place, then you can send out bits at 57.6. Now, if that isn't the most hardcore thing you've ever heard, I don't know what is. But uh, he came out with a, a term program, or somebody built a program around it called um, RetroTerm that works with my firmware and, and operates at 57.6. And he uses it for streaming audio and uh, streaming, yeah, streaming PCM samples, like 4-bit PCM samples and streaming SID music and doing really quick downloads of, of high-res art and that sort of stuff. And uh, again, Zmodem is the name of my project. And when I started it in 2016, I had three goals. Uh, they weren't all as important as the others. Um, the, the most important goal in the first one was that it, it looked like a modem. Uh, I, I wanted this for compatibility. I wanted the maximum amount of software, all the software written for a decade that works with modems. I wanted to work with this firmware. Um, I wanted the, the, the next most important, is actually the last one. I wanted it to be an internet platform. I wanted it to be something programmable so that someone could sit in front of a, a machine of C64 in basic, write code and get results. And sort of a, an afterthought almost is that it be an appliance, have some built-in features, kind of like the, uh, the uh, original um, Leaf Bloomquist modem did. So like putting in an IRC client, for example. Um, these are some of the features, and I'm getting squeezed on time and trying to figure out what I should emphasize. Hmm. So these are examples of some of the AT commands that it supports. Um, a lot of these, uh, like this one is a standard command, but whenever I found letters that were not used by any modem standard that I could borrow for Wi-Fi specific stuff like ATW, I, I did so. And uh, some could argue that's a bad idea. It's actually not, not worked out to be a problem for me so far. Um, the modem supports hardware and software flow control. And you can turn on which kind you use in the modem, and then your terminal program has to match it. Uh, for terminal support, uh, it, can, it can do ASCII, ANSI, Topetsky decoding, including color. So like you can, it, you can be on an ANSI BBS, and it'll translate that to Pesky colors as best it can. Um, you can customize your end of line. Uh, uh, you can actually put it into a telnet mode where it will eat telnet codes and respond to them correctly so that they will leave you alone. And that's the when you're dealing with Telnet, that's the most important thing. You want these codes just to leave you alone because otherwise they're just going to be dumping garbage and they're going to be hanging up your session because they're going to be asking questions and, and getting angry when you don't answer. So one of the features in the firmware is that, is that it will, you can put it in this mode and it will just answer seamlessly and you won't even know it's doing it. Um, you can turn on, that's a, that's a standard command, ATE for a half full duplex. And you can use ATB to change the baud rate on the fly. And I think that's why RetroTerm ended up using my firmware is because they want to be able to change between baud rates while the modem, on the fly, while the modem's connected, doing stuff. Uh, I, I put in a phone book. The, the main reason I put in the phone book was for that right there. There was some, uh, an old dial-up service uh, called Quantum Link that eventually became America Online, by the way. Um, but that was, that was revived at one point and the, and so that you could use the old Quantum Link software, but it required an actual phone number to dial. You had to, you had to not just send it an address on the internet, you had to send it a phone number, the software. I'm talking about the client software. So I added a phone book so that you could assign a actual arbitrary phone number to a web address and you could give it all of your terminal settings and then this software would dial up the, the recreation of the old Quantum Link service. And I don't know if they've also recreated AOL. I'm not sure if we want them to, but. <laughs> um, I'm running low on CDs. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the, of course, it, it supports all kinds of configuration options. Um, 
including you can you can just toggle the values of the pins on off. This was really important for supporting some machines that had UARTs that would go silent and would ignore all incoming data unless data carrier detect was active. And it and think about that. The, the old modems, there was no reason for your terminal program to be doing anything with it in you know before the Hayes modems came out. If you weren't connected over the phone line to a service, there was no reason for it to do anything. So uh, the UART being silent when nobody was connected kind of made sense. But when Hayes modem came out, you needed to be able to interact with your modem even when it wasn't connected to anybody. And so that became a problem. So you have some pin level control. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to do over-the-air updates. And I do, I do update the firmware from time to time. Uh, and uh, it also has a real-time clock feature since most of the old 8-bits don't. And uh, it'll fetch the time from uh, the internet. And you just tell it your time zone so it'll report it correctly. And it's got some online help. Now, this, this, is, this, is, this place was uh, especially important for me because this is, uh, this is talking about some of, the, um, some of the programmable aspects. In particular, um, being able to set up a socket listener. So the, firm, the firmware will make your modem listen on a socket for a connection, and then, and then it will configure the serial port as if an actual call had arrived from a telephone to a BBS. As you run all kinds of old BBS software, and it will behave seamlessly like it's supposed to. Um, you can customize your busy signal as, as well, since the old 8-bits, they didn't tend to like having multiple lines, not like the later, bigger machines did. And uh, for uh, other aspects of, of sort of socket work is that uh, you can use a command called ATC to make multiple outgoing connections. So you can, you can uh, yeah. This was really especially important for FTP because I don't know if you know this, but whenever you FTP files, you have one connection. If you're doing a passive, passive mode FTP, you have one connection where it's entering commands that the user's typing and another connection that's just for getting the data. And so the modem needed to be able to support these independently and to let an application running on the 8-bit know which connection is, is sending which data to you at the time. And this was done by organizing incoming data into little 255-byte packets that had a little header that would uh, tell you uh, what, which, which connection, because like I said, multiple connections, which connection this data came from, uh, how many... Uh, what the CRC is of it, so a checksum in case you want to look for errors, and uh, the size of the packet, of course, and the index number. That is, you've been connected to this this place, uh, and it'll just start numbering every incoming packet, one to whatever. And that's important again for error correction, so that if you know you know if you last got three and now you've gotten four from the same one, or now now you've gotten five, you've missed four somewhere, so you need to ask for four back. And these last things, I'm, I'm uh, down here at the bottom, uh, the custom packet delimiters and masks and filtering state machine. Those are meant for taking work off of old 8-bits by allowing the modem to do things like strip off all the line feeds, for example, or um, give me all the data in every packet up to this character, up to the carriage return, for example, and reserve the rest of it for a next request. That sort of thing. And then a filtering state machine, which is a big long string you can write that, will, that can do that sort of stuff on a character by character basis. So if I, get a, if I get an open bracket, go to state one and then look for this character so that you can build almost like a little HTML parser or something if you wanted to. Uh, that was something someone just requested from me over on GitHub. Um, these are an example of some of the little uh, basic apps I wrote. And yes, that is a VIC-20 on IRC. Um, uh, so there's IRC, there's an FTP client. Uh, one I especially like is the D64W get, which will let you get a, D, a, an Im a disk image directly from the internet and write it directly to a disk, no, no in between. Um, also wrote a couple terminal programs, but those are worthless. They're just there for when I need to do configuration. And this was the culmination of it, an old pet game that I used to love to play called Weather. It's a two-player game. 
And if that isn't perfect for a network game, I don't know what is. And when I was able to port that old pet game to the 64 and add networking to it so you could play this game over the internet with your friend, that's when I knew I'd accomplished my, my, my goals. Uh, and then later I did some GeoSaps. Um, the one on the left is a uh, VT100 ANSI terminal. And the one on the right is a 40 column CBM graphics. And yes, it is rendering 40 column CBM graphics on a high res screen. And if that strikes you as a bad idea, it's because it's, that's the correct thought. It's, it's a bad idea. Why? The, computer has, the computer has hardware to do that automatically for you, and yet I'm doing it in software. It, it just seemed like a fun thing to do at the time. <laughs> um, I did mention retro terms, so I'm not going to go over that again. That, that's the term that lets you stream the PC because it, it, it does the 57600 baud on the user port using uh, C, CPU cycle timing. And I mentioned V15, uh, V1541, which is the, the disk downloading software that was meant for the original Comet modem. Z modem also supports that same protocol, so you can do all that stuff. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is, is that a version of the, of the same modem was done for true RS-232. So this, this was mainly aimed at like Amigas, old PCs, anything with a true RS-232 port. Runs the same firmware with a different chip, namely the ESP32. Um, it, it, the firmware compiles for both, both chips and still does, although I'm recently changed to a new version of the ESP32 libraries. So if you had been compiling in the past and you're having trouble now, read the README again. Um, I also added an IRC client again. That's part of sort of what makes it, uh, you know, add some appliance features to it. Uh, SSL and TLS support was added mostly because I have some extra RAM now to play with and so I can start adding new things. Uh, however, the certificates for SSL and TLS are not verified at all. I do not keep four gigabytes of root certs on your little microcontroller. So the protocol works. We're going to have to be happy with that. Um, also, I, as soon as I got some extra RAM, with the switch to an, ES, with the, to an 8 meg chip, I was able to uh, pull down libssh2, which is a, uh, a, a library for doing SSH. So you can connect to Linux machine securely. Securely. And a ping feature. Hmm. And uh, it, I also supported support, I added support for a printer protocol called IPP so that you can use your wireless modem to print documents to a real modern printer that supports IPP. Now, I go through cups myself, but some printers actually support it natively. And if they do, you're in luck. I even did a, a driver for Geos for the old 8-bits so that you can print from Geos. And you can see in the picture there, in the picture there in the front are some Geos pronounced, and in the back, something from an Amiga. And uh, the Guru modem also comes with a little SD card, so some shell commands were added just for getting data to and from that through the serial port. So added some Z modem, X modem, Kermit transfers, and that sort of thing. And upcoming, as, as now that I have access to more RAM, I'm starting to work on SLIP and PPOE so that we'll be able to do dial out from, uh, from Amigas and the C64 using these modems. Uh, I also want to add Gopher because for some reason, this one guy keeps emailing me. <laughs> and I want to add, I want to get more pins on the modem so that I can do pulse dialing support. And if that sounds crazy, it probably is, but it's really cool how it works. It used to like pull the phone off the hook, on and off in the wires. And that's how it did pulse dialing. That you, if you did that five times, you were dialing a five. That's crazy. I want to do it. And um, the last thing on here is there's a fellow who, who added sound support to the firmware because he wanted his version of the modem to make dialing noises. And that's it. Here are some links. Timing. Thank you very much. Are there any Gopher servers left? Yeah. Apparently, yes. Oh, yeah, question, sure. Uh, what was your ATW command for again? I'm sorry. Uh, well, so there, there's a, 
there's a little menu system you can use for configuration. You don't have to. Uh -huh. But originally, I wanted everything to be doable, and still is. I want everything to be doable with an AT command right. um, so that you can do things one shot from the computer. Right. And uh, ATW is for either if you send ATW without an argument, it'll list all, all your wireless access points. And if you send it with an argument, it will connect to the listed access point with a listed password. code on the 8-bits um, outside of BASIC, or do you do any coding outside of BASIC on the 8-bits? I have to, and I, I was going to mention this if I had more time, but I, I have to use a little ML, and it, it's, not because the, it's not because BASIC is too slow to deal with the internet. That's not the problem. It's because the BASIC on the 8-bits is too slow to deal with string parsing. And so I have a little ML routine that I call PML. You, you might recall it was actually listed up there. Uh, I call it the packet machine language or something like that. And it, all it does is string parsing because it's, it does it really fast. So, so the majority of your stuff is basically just calling a couple of assembly routines to be parsed? Just to do string parsing, yes. Okay. Because think about how you would have to do this in basic. You'd have to, you'd have to do it. You could do an input okay. to get the header. Okay. And then, but then you'd have to pull in each character in the packet one at a time. And every time you do that, you're creating a new string. You're creating garbage, which has to be collected. This is bad. Are you hand assembling or are you using something like a cross compiler? Oh, uh, I'm a big fan of an old computer assembler called LADS, which is, no one's ever heard of it. It's, it's, it's dumb to use, but I love it. it and I will never stop. Oh, no, it runs on 64. Yeah. Is it Lazarus? LADS, L-A-D-S. Oh, That's a type in assembler, right? From yeah, it was from a magazine, you darn tootin'. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, I used the Commodore logo as the assembler because I don't know why it was in there, but if you had the logo distribution from Commodore, it had a machine language monitor, a assembler, and everything else. And I don't think I saw the turtle once, but I used it as an assembler. It was the weirdest thing in the world. Very nice. Wow. <laughs> Anyone else? Any questions, comments, nostalgic remarks, corrections, anything? Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You.